If you wanted to consolidate your Commodore 64 and floppy drives into one single case, then in 1987, Schmaltz Unternehmensberatung introduced the CompuCase 64D conversion kit. So, let's open it up, fix what we need to, and review this computer, keyboard, and floppy drive case conversion. Removing the two rear screws and opening up the copy case reveals the insides of two floppy disk drives. Removing the single LED allows us to completely remove the case. Here we can see the outer height of these floppy drives is set by these long bolts through these tabs which were originally used to connect to the 1541's actual case. Whilst their inside height is secured via this central metal chassis. At the rear of the unit we can see the floppy disk drive's power switch, power input, fuse and the two 6-pin DIN serial IEC disk drive connectors. And on the rear of the chassis we can see this hole which is presumably for this what's labelled a power lead. Removing the two floppy disk drives from the main chassis reveals what appears to be a detachable power LED and tethered keyboard connector. In addition, there are two original floppy disk drive screws which appear to have been replaced by this DIY case guide. Removing the detachable chassis, the keyboard cable and the detachable power LED cabling, we can now reveal the Commodore 64 motherboard. In addition, we've identified these two metal brackets which would be used to secure to the backing plate. Having removed the Commodore 64's motherboard and paper shielding, a closer inspection of the base identifies this logo and number. On the rear of the base we've identified these aftermarket rubber feet which we'll remove and replace with ones correct for the time. This 1987 Commodore 64C motherboard supports the following configuration. The input output interface, the definable character ROM, which by default looks like this. The kernel and basic ROM, the 8 bit CPU, and the two dynamic RAMs, which is configured with system RAM, basic and user RAM, cartridge ROM low, cartridge ROM high. Also stacked with basic ROM, more user RAM, which is stacked with the character ROM, and also video, audio, and screen color RAM, and an area reserved for the input output process configuration. And finally, yet again, more user RAM, which is stacked with the kernel ROM. Moving on, we've got the PLA and the infamous VIC-2 video and SID sound chips. And finally, a second CIA. And looking at the interfaces, starting on the side, we've got two joystick ports, a power switch and a power input DIN. And on the rear, we have the expansion port, the TV RF connection, the audio and video DIN, the serial port DIN, the cassette port edge connector, and the user port edge connector. And 
On the rear of the board, it's clean with no bodge wires. The CompuCase keyboard needs a good clean and a retro bright. Opening the keyboard up, we can identify this uses a standard Commodore 64 keyboard with a non-standard connector. Removing the faded CompuCase badge, it was now time for the top of the keyboard to enjoy its retro brighting treatment whilst we head off into our first montage. To secure the motherboard onto the base, we need to screw in these spacers. And after cleaning the edge connectors, it was time to reinstall the original paper shielding and secure it at the side with some matching tape. Having reviewed the internal central chassis, we can see there are some power inputs a wiring loom and a heavy duty monitor stand insert. Having reviewed the power configuration, we can see we've got the connector with the input power, the two disk drives, which are both powered by a single switch. However, direct mains voltage to the Commodore 64 isn't right. So I'm sticking with this new external power supply unit. Progressing the build, we've now secured the internal chassis, connected the keyboard cable, and secured the power LED and connection into the Commodore 64. Turning our attention back to the floppy disk drives, we can see we've got two kernel ROMs, 16K of RAM, a 6502 CPU and the input output controller. We've also got these two rather large capacitors, so let's go. Securing the two internal floppy disk drives to the main chassis, it was now time to install the CompuCase colour-coded floppy disk drive faciers.
we can now configure our device numbers for our internal floppy disk drives. And this is achieved by locating and configuring what are called jumper pads. The default is device 8. However, by cutting through the right one, we increase that number by 1 and the left one by 2 until both jumper pads are cut through. Fortunately, our first drive is already configured as device 8. However, our second one is configured as device 10. So we need to cut through the right hand pad and resolder the left one. This is an SD to IEC. Having modified the rear of this internal floppy disk, we're going to use this to install an internal solid state hard drive. Having soldered connections to the internal buttons and 5 volt power requirements, it was now time to install the rear panel onto the back of the compu case. As our requirements for the rear panel have now changed, I designed and 3D printed multiple iterations of a new backing plate until eventually reaching the final design. As the 3D printer wasn't big enough, I had to incorporate it as two separate parts. So securing it temporarily with this tape, installed the SD to IEC buttons and the unit itself into the back of the rear panel and secured it using super glue followed by hot glue. Having removed this rubber cover, we can see the fabrication of this case is quite poor. And due to its age, it has discolored in places and is prone to splitting and cracks. So we need to be very careful with how we handle this piece of retro computing history. Internally, it's the same story. So I've secured the splits with epoxy resin. Looking back at the original advert, point seven is the optional rotating monitor stand which cost just under 70 Dutch guilders. And we know this because of the Dutch spelling of price, but also this logo, which was a Dutch chain of department stores. On the rear of the stand, it has a single pivot point, and on the front, it's countersunk, which is probably why it came with this block of wood and this non-slip monitor mat. So let's rejuvenate this old block of wood by covering it in a white vinyl wrap. But there's a problem. The hole doesn't fit anymore. So correcting the hole, creating and 3D printing this hole cover and adding some coins to adjust the height. It was now time to install the optional rotating monitor stand. Having reconnected the Commodore 64's power LED and adjusted the internal floppy disk drive's height to fit the case, I installed this step down voltage regulator to adjust the voltage between the power LED and the activity from the internal SD card by using these tricolor LEDs to display multiple activities. Having set the device number to 10 for the internal solid state hard drive using the guide holes in the new rear panel Let's secure it to the compi case, ready for testing.
having applied the internal solid state drive label, the now detachable keyboard, and the image previous and next and reset buttons for the internal disk, it's now time to enjoy the CompuCase conversion kit as it was intended back in 1987. Reviewing our current selection, we can see that we're on drive 10, which is the SD to IEC. However, pressing F3 will go to the next device, which in this case loads from device 8. As we can see here, with the reference 1541, followed by the contents of the physical floppy disk. Pressing F3 again takes us to device 9, which is the right hand 1541. Pressing F3 again takes us back to device 10, which is the internal SD to IEC. And pressing F3 for the final time, it cycles us back to drive 8, where we can see International Karate. So let's load it up to play us out on this CompuCase review and modern mods.